So our next functional group, our next type of organic compounds, are the so-called halogenoalkanes. Old people like me call these alkyl halides, which is a lot easier to say than halogenoalkanes. So I'll probably be using those phrases interchangeably as I go through. In other words, I'll try to use the more modern halogenoalkanes, but I will often revert to what I've been saying for the last 40 odd years and say alkyl halides. Anyway, whichever way you say it, it's fairly obvious from the name, I trust, what these are. These are alkanes in which at least one of the hydrogens has been replaced by an X, where X is any of the halogens. Now, we'll very rarely mention the fluoroalkanes, at least in this chemistry part, when we get into the applications of halogenoalkanes, the fluoro. Um, alkanes feature quite considerably, but we're going to be interested in the chloro, the bromo, and the iodo alkanes in this particular talk. Their general formula is relatively straightforward. All we we're doing is we're replacing a hydrogen with a halogen. So you can see here CnH2n plus 2 would be our alkanes. Replace one of those hydrogens with a halogen, and it's just 2n plus 1x. Nothing fancy like reducing the number of um, hydrogens because of extra carbon-carbon bonds like we saw with the cycloalkanes or the alkenes. Just very, very simply, every single halogen you have on replaces one of the hydrogens. Let's have a look at a few examples just to point some things out about the naming. They're very much treated as just alkyl branches. So where you would have had a methyl group, here we've got a chloro group. So this would be 1-chloro, 3-methyl, butane. There's no difference in the priority in terms of numbering scheme between a halogen and an alkyl branch. So you could quite easily see something like 2-methyl, 3-chloro, because it made sense to number the methyl group lower than the chlorine. Um, this is, of course, a <clears throat> primary alkyl halide because the carbon to which the Chlorine is attached, in this case, is only connected to one other carbon. Another one, try and name this before I click it. Well, we've got one, two, three, four as the longest chain. We've got a methyl group on the two. Uh, we've got a chlorine group on the two. So this one I could call 2-chloro, 3-methyl, which is my preferred one, or I could have called it 2-methyl, 3-chloro. Either way around, it tells you the same molecule. This is an example, of course, of a secondary alkyl halide because the chlorine to which the carbon is attached is bonded to two other carbons. And as our last example, this one here, again, name it before I start. Again, it's a butane, one, two, three, four. Here, no ambiguity about how we number it. We've got both the methyl and the chlorine on the second carbon, so 2-chloro, two 2-methyl two butane. And then this would be a tertiary alkyl halide because this carbon is bonded to one, two, three other carbons. With this assignment, so primary, secondary, and tertiary, which is going to become more and more important as we go through this particular module and then also in the next module on alcohols, a lot of times it's one of those few times in which I think educationally you're better off using the skeletal structures because you can see very easily the chlorine bonded to this carbon, which goes to one other one, making a primary. Here the chlorine bonded to this carbon, which goes to two other ones, making it a secondary. And finally here the chlorine bonded to a carbon which goes to one, two, three other carbons, making it a tertiary. Now, of course, halogenoalkanes should not be strange to you because we've talked about them in every single one of our organic modules so far. When we were dealing with alkanes, we saw that you could react those up with a halogen and light. It was a free radical mechanism that allowed the halogenation of the alkane. Now, you might remember that this was one in which is a very um, non-specific reaction. Those, those free radicals that we made, either the chlorine atom or the bromine atom, would attack wherever they felt like. But if you remember, as it was a free radical mechanism, um, the tertiary free radicals much better than secondary free radicals, much better than primary free radicals, which means that this is actually a fairly good way to make tertiary halides. In other words, you take a hydrogen off a tertiary carbon, that becomes the free radical, which is then 
um, grabs itself another um, bromine or chlorine atom to make the tertiary bromide or chloride. We also saw halogenoalkanes in the alkene in which we had addition reactions either of HX where X could be a bromine or a chlorine and if you remember this followed the old Markovnikov rules which means that it was better for making secondary and tertiary halides than primary halides but then we also saw the dihalides in which we reacted up an alkene with either bromine or chlorine so that we had two bromine atoms where the double bond used to be or two chlorine atoms where the double bond used to be. So halogenoalkanes are no strangers to you thus far. It's just in this module we're focusing on them. One of the most important things about the halogenoalkanes that we haven't really encountered with alkanes and alkenes is that there is an electronegativity consideration. Electronegativity of carbon, 2.55, there are the electronegativities of the halogens. And you can see that with the exceptional of the marginal iodine, these are all significantly bigger than the electronegativity of the carbon. This means that the carbon halogen bond is a polar bond. Now this has massive implications First of all, in the physical properties, and I could dwell upon this, but I'm not going to do too much other than just point out if we do a comparison of CH4, CH3F, CH3Cl, CH3Br and CH3I, we see that these are, of course, the boiling points are increasing as we go down because the mass is increasing. But there is a much bigger jump between the CH4 and the CH3F than there is between any of the others. And that's because CH4 is a nice symmetrical non-polar molecule. Thus the only things it has holding it together in the solid or the liquid state are dispersion forces. <clears throat> However, all of our alkyl halides or halogenoalkanes have those polar carbon fluorine bonds so therefore they have dipole dipole interactions as well as the dispersion interactions so we have polar molecules with our halogenoalkanes that affects their physical properties here i've talked about the boiling point could have talked about the melting point could also have talked about the solubilities although that's not as crucial a thing as we're going to discuss in later modules now as well as polar bonds affecting in the physical properties, let's think about what they do to the chemical properties, in other words, the reactivity of the alkyl halides, the halogenoalkanes. Well, the carbon has a slightly positive charge. That means it's an electrophile. It likes negatives. And of course, more importantly, seeing as how that carbon has a slight positive, it is going to be attacked by nucleophiles. These are negative things, either anions or things that have extra lone pairs of electrons. And that nucleophilic attack is the idea that drives the reactivity of halogenoalkanes, as we will talk about in the next few movies.